Uh, my name is David Ellenson. Uh, I am the director, current director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies, and it is a great, great pleasure to be here with you today. In welcoming you to the center, I'm reminded that in Judaism or in Hebrew, uh, there is actually no term for history, or at least in the way that the Greeks use the term, historia. Uh, Rabbi Leo Beck, the last duly elected leader of the Jewish people in Germany, pointed this out in his book, This People Israel. He pointed out that the word in Hebrew that's used for history is toldot. Toldot, which literally means generations. The shorish, the root of this term toldot is yeled, boy, yalda, girl, laledet, laholid, to give birth. The key point that Rabbi Beck made in this exposition of the word toldot that is used for history in the Hebrew language is that we are really speaking here about generations and we are talking about linkages. That is to say, history is not something that is simply in the past, but who we are at the present moment and what we aspire to become is all part of the foundation upon which we build our own sense of identity and being in the world. For me today, as director of the center, there are any number of linkages, uh, certainly in a very, very significant way to Lynn and Stacy Schusterman, to Sandy Carden, the president of the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Foundation, Family Foundation, and to Lisa Eisen, the vice president. Uh, my linkages are very, very real on all kinds of personal and other levels. Uh, indeed, Lynn, undoubtedly from a dinner one night, played a significant role along with Lisa Lynch, who was then the acting president of the university, and Elon Trowen, who was then the director, the founding director of the Schusterman Center, in persuading me, and I would say it was persuasion at that point, uh, to become director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies, so that on this day when we salute 10 years of accomplishments of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. I am mindful on a personal level of all the links that bind me to so many of you who are here. We are very, very, very pleased and honored to welcome Ambassador Daniel Shapiro and President Rivka Karmi of Ben-Gurion University. Daniel, I will say when we talk about linkages, he is, as I know he will be introduced later by my colleague who plays the most significant role in running the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies, Dr. Rachel Fish. Uh, Daniel Shapiro is a graduate of Brandeis University. For those of you who are students uh, who are here today, he sat in these chairs at one point, maybe not in this exact room, but in other rooms on the Brandeis campus. And I will say, uh, as a past president of Hebrew Union College, uh, I am always very proud that you, Daniel, are an alumnus of the Chalutzim program, uh, a Hebrew-speaking program at the Olin Sang Ruby Union Institute, uh, sponsored by the Reform Movement in America. I believe you met your wife there, uh, and later on you studied even for a year at the Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. So we are very, very proud of all of your accomplishments and very delighted to be able to welcome you here today. Uh, to Rivka Karmi, uh, one of the things that we primarily share is that we have mutual best friends, uh, Marvin Israelo and Dorian Goldman, who work so diligently on behalf of Ben-Gurion University. Your work as a geneticist has really gained worldwide fame. We are so proud that uh, you grace us here today. And the role that you've played as president of Ben-Gurion University has certainly allowed the university in so many significant ways to fulfill the aspirations of David Ben-Gurion and having the university be really the gateway to the development of the Negev. We are also very mindful. My predecessor, Elon Trowen, has had the privilege of directing and uh, guiding two significant institutions. He was the director of graduate studies for decades at Ben-Gurion University and transformed it 
into a first-rate uh, institution of graduate studies and higher learning in Israel and throughout the world, and certainly as the founding director of the Schusterman Center, so much of what we have uh, here would not have been possible. Rachel Fish, others, and I could not have worked upon it without the work that you did. So we are really very mindful of that and all the linkages then that bring us together. Finally, I'd make one other observation about Brandeis University before I introduce our president and we commence with the rest of the afternoon. Uh, when we talk about generations in Toldot, one needs to be aware of the history of Jewish studies and the attachment to the state of Israel in this institution that celebrates its 70th birthday this year along with Hakamat Medina Israel, along with the establishment of the State of Israel and the 10th anniversary of the Schusterman Center. When President Abe Sacker established this university in the Near Eastern and Judaic Studies Department, he brought Shimon Ravidovich, Nahum Glotzer, Nahum Sarna, the father of our beloved Jonathan, Alexander Altman, Ben Halpern, each of these men, if I were to use rabbinic parlance, was actually an eshkol, an isha hakol bo. An eshkol in Hebrew is a cluster. And the Mishnah says that such men, each one of whom is an eshkol, are people who possess enormous encyclopedias of knowledge. All of these men, Ravi Dovich, Sarna, Glotzer, Altman, Halpern, one cannot exaggerate the breadth of knowledge these men had of classical Jewish sources and Western philosophy, sociology, and history. These men made Brandeis University the unquestioned center for Jewish studies in the United States. And through Ben Halpern, it became really the locus for the birth of Israel studies on this continent as well. These men trained people like Paul Mendesflor of Hebrew University and the University of Chicago, Yehuda Reinhardt, our former president, Deborah Lipstadt, the famed Holocaust historian who teaches at Emory, Fran Molino, the famed historian of French Jewry, who teaches at Wellesley College, and I could name many, many more. Many of you were sitting in these rooms today. Part of why I bring all of this up is that in introducing you, President Leibowitz, I think it is crucial that the president of Brandeis University have an understanding of what this legacy, what this heritage is that this institution and this center builds upon. And in this sense, then, I want to quote, Ron, from your inaugural address on November 3rd, 2016. You stated, founding president Sacker proceeded from the start with a multi-dimensional understanding of Brandeis's identity. He pledged that Brandeis would be vitally concerned with Jewish studies, that there would be a close relationship to the educational institutions of Israel, and that there would be proper respect for Jewish tradition. At the same time, he said, there was no expectation that the university would become a parochial school on a university level. You then added, the 1948 commitment to Jewish studies and ties to the state of Israel articulated by Abram Sacker should be reaffirmed and his 21st century update should recognize the dynamics of Judaism in the United States, Israel, and worldwide by strengthening our academic offerings and research capacity in this area. Ron Leibowitz understands very well the meaning of toldot, what it means to be linked to the past, even as we sit here at this moment and celebrate the present and look to the future, it is with great, great honor that I introduce the president of Brandeis University, President Ronald Leibowitz. Well, thank you, David, for that warm introduction. And, um, I find it hard to believe it was difficult to convince anyone to do administrative work at any <laughs> university, especially these days. And we're glad that you acceded. It gives me great pleasure 
today to welcome all of you here to campus as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. Due to the vision of former President Yehuda Reinhardt's and the vision and generosity of Lynn Schusterman and the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, as well as the creativity and the determination of Ilan Troen, founding director of the center, the Schusterman Center has exceeded the great expectations this university and its supporters had from at the outset. The center has fulfilled these expectations in so many ways and has become the premier educational setting for Israel studies in North America. In addition to all it has done on this campus, it has seeded programs in other colleges and universities, many which otherwise would never have included the study of Israel in their curricula. Our graduate students are at the heart of the center. They have earned and are earning their doctorates across a wide range of departments at Brandeis. A number of our alumni, as well as our postdoctoral fellows, have gone on to teach in universities throughout North America and Israel, and our Summer Institute for Israel Studies has served as an important complement to our graduate program. The Summer Institute has played a seminal role in fostering Israel studies throughout the world, and 291 professors from North America, South America, Europe, Australia, Africa, and Asia have attended this program held at Brandeis and in Israel every summer. These faculty have taught rigorous courses on Israel studies to more than 27,000 students worldwide during the last decade. The center, through its publications under the ongoing leadership of Alain Troen, has published 24 books in Israel studies, many of them award-winning, and the internationally renowned journal Israel Studies, published in partnership with Ben-Gurion University, has more than 3,000 subscriptions and is recognized throughout the world as the leading academic journal in the field. Our literacy project, under the guidance of Rachel Fish, educates teachers, community leaders, and laypersons through a variety of outreach programs. It has published the book, Essential Israel, which has become an indispensable resource for those who wish to learn about Israel in its legal, political, cultural, and religious dimensions. In addition, the center and its faculty offer many courses each year in Israel studies and administers the Francis Taylor Eisenstadt Scholarship Program. This program, established by Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt in memory of his wife, Fran, a Brandeis alumna and close personal friend of Lynn Schusterman, supports five Brandeis undergraduates to study and work in Israel each year. These students make presentations on campus after they return from their time in Israel, and their experiences are transformational. The center also brings to campus countless lectures and programs to discuss Israel-related topics. Our speakers today, Ambassador and Brandeis alumnus Daniel Shapiro and Dr. Rivka Carmi, renowned geneticist and outstanding president of Ben-Gurion University, reflect the quality of those who come to speak on our campus. Dan and Rivka, each of you honors us with your presence here today, and your appearance on this wonderful occasion is testimony to the vital role Brandeis and the Schusterman Center play in the world of Israel studies. And of course, the quality of the Schusterman Center rests on the quality of its leadership and our faculty. Ganit and Corey, Yehuda Mirsky, and Alana Zobel are models of engaged teaching and excellent scholarship. And David Ellenson as director, along with Rachel Fish as associate director, have built upon and strengthened the legacy bequeathed to them by Ilan Troen. All this gives us great cause to pause and celebrate during this 10th year of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies and the 70th year of the State of Israel. At the same time, we not only rest with justifiable pride on our past achievements, but we also look forward to the future with great anticipation and aspiration. I am so pleased today to announce the appointment of university professor and eminent Jewish historian Jonathan Sarna as the incoming director of the Schusterman Center. Jonathan has lectured at every institution of higher learning in the state of Israel and taught at many, including at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he has twice served as Lady Davis visiting professor. I am delighted the center will have his steady and distinguished hand at the helm. I am equally delighted to announce the elevation and appointment of Rachel Fish to the position of executive director of the center. Rachel has been with... Rachel has been with the Schusterman Center since the beginning. 
She earned her doctorate as a Schusterman Fellow in our Department of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies. Rachel is at the center of virtually all center activities and the center's success, that's a lot of centers in that one sentence, and the center's success over this past decade are due in no small measure to her tireless efforts and vision. We thank you. It also gives me great pleasure to announce the appointment of Alexander Kay to the Stoll Chair in Israel Studies. Alex is an outstanding young scholar. He received his doctorate from Columbia University and currently holds the Schottenstein Chair in Israel Studies at The Ohio State University. We look forward to Alex joining us as an assistant professor in the Department of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies this summer. And finally, I'm delighted to announce the newly endowed Marash and Akuan Chair in Ottoman, Mizrahi, and Sephardic Jewish Studies. This position will be awarded to a future tenure track or tenured faculty member with expertise in the history and experience of Sephardic or Mizrahi Jews in Israel. A search to fill the chair will begin this year. All these appointments suggest a bright future for Israel Studies at Brandeis. We are confident we will grow from strength to strength and hope that all of you are proud of what has been and will yet be accomplished. I thank all of you who have made this possible, but no one more than Lynn Schusterman and the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation. And with that, it gives me great pleasure at this time to call upon Stacy Schusterman, co-chair of the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation to address us on this joyous occasion. Stacy. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, years ago, my mom was hiking in Aspen with Judah Reinhardt's, and it was on that hike uh, that the center was born. So as you all know, Aspen is a place where um, it's beautiful mountains and people who um, buy expensive homes, and that was an expensive hike, but one that, <laughs> one that we're very excited took place. Uh, my mom imagined a world-class center in which all facets of Israel could be explored from diverse perspectives. She imagined a center that could stimulate the study of Israel at universities across the country. As my mom said at the center's dedication, Israel, past, present, and future, deserves its rightful place in the academic world, and Brandeis will be the standard bearer. Ten years later, as President Leibowitz noted, the center is preparing the next generation of scholars at Brandeis and beyond. It is training faculty all over the world. Through its summer institute, professors have developed more than 1,000 courses, reaching over 27,000 students. And it is sharing knowledge with the field and so much more. We feel great pride in the center's accomplishments and the growth of Israel studies generally. And we believe its work is far from finished. Each of us knows that college campuses are where tomorrow's diplomats, executives, elected officials, artists, etc form their worldviews. It is the students studying at Brandeis and on campuses nationwide who will determine the future of the U.S.-Israel relationship. And we all know the broader campus environment is more complex than ever as it relates to Israel. Students are struggling with the growing sophistication of the anti-Israel voices, and some are becoming apathetic toward or alienated from Israel. Israel studies can play a critical and positive role in countering the negative, inaccurate, and incomplete picture of Israel being painted by its detractors. And so, as the first 10 years have been about building the field of Israel studies, the next 10 can be about more fully integrating it into the fabric of academic life. Our hope is that the study of Israel will be embedded into departments of all disciplines, medical, law, and business schools, research labs, design and film schools can all benefit from what Israel has to offer. For 70 years, Israel has been a symbol of possibilities. Students deserve to learn from Israel's ability to discuss, debate, and bring new ideas to life. This is our hope for the next decade, to make Israel's studies a more integral part of all that is studied on campuses. Brandeis can take the lead in this front, we hope that new positions like the Occuan Chair will help expand your work and bring new partners to the table. I want to thank the leadership of the center, past and present, to Ron Leibowitz and Yehuda Reinhartz for your commitment to Israel Studies, to Elon Trone, the center's founding director who helped launch the center, 
to David Ellenson for his committed service to the center, to Rachel Fish, who started as one of our first graduate students, as you heard, and is now its new executive director. I also want to congratulate Jonathan Sarna, who is joining as director, and Alex Kay, the new Stoll Chair. Finally, thank you to our founding partners who will be here this evening, Joanna and John Jacobson, and Susie and Michael Gelman for your generosity. We have helped to lay the foundation for the center, and now it is up to the next generation of leadership to fully realize the vision for it. Thank you. It takes a village, folks. It takes a village. And some of us were very lucky to be here on the ground floor. So we welcome all of you, and we are pleased that you join us today. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ambassador Daniel Shapiro. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome him as he is now the Distinguished Visiting Fellow at Tel Aviv University's Institute of National Security Studies, which follows a diverse career of over 20 years in senior governmental positions and foreign policy and national security positions in the United States government. In July of 2011, Ambassador Shapiro was appointed by President Obama as the United States Ambassador to Israel, and he served in this capacity until the end of the Obama administration. He has managed U.S.-Israel relations during the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, the Iran nuclear agreement, and regional instability during periods of bilateral tensions. Ambassador, sounds like every day. Ambassador Shapiro is not new to Brandeis University, as we've heard. He received his undergraduate degree here from Brandeis, and he has participated in other Israel-related programming at Brandeis University, such as our Young Leader Seminar on Israel Studies for high school students. He received his MA degree from that university on the same side of the Charles, Harvard, and currently lives in Israel with his family. We thank you for your participation. We look forward to learning from you today. Well, thank you very much, and congratulations to uh, the new executive director, uh, Rachel Fish, for the kind introduction. And it is a definite honor uh, to be with everybody here today. Uh, it's always special to come to Brandeis, I should say, to come home to Brandeis. Uh, I have to confess uh, to a bit of sheepishness. Um, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. If back in 1990, my professors had been asked to look in the room and who would be invited, I guess, who would be invited back one day as a future US ambassador to Israel, I don't think the odds are too high that their gaze would have landed on me. I'll also confess to a little PTSD being in this room. I'm pretty sure I bombed a final sitting right over there. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. It's, the, it's maybe the second time I'm coming to Brandeis under uh, maybe slightly shady circumstances. Uh, see, I transferred to Brandeis as a junior. That's uh, how I got here uh, in the fall of 1989, uh, following my freshman uh, year at Washington University and my sophomore year at Hebrew University. And I wrote some very compelling essays uh, about my interest in Jewish and Islamic history and my knowledge of Hebrew and Arabic and uh, the strength of the Near East and Judaic Studies Department and my plan to uh, research the Jewish communities of Palestine in the 19th century and so on. It was all true. What I left out of those, those essays was the other reason, some might say the real reason, uh, that I was trying to come here was so that I could be with my girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> I know that's not what the admissions committee wants to hear, uh, but I hope that 25 years of marriage and three beautiful daughters and one ambassadorship later uh, all can be forgiven. Uh, so I also bring with me warm regards from Julie uh, Fisher, my wife, uh, class of 1990, who wishes she could be here with me today. Uh, Brandeis, of course, was for me and for Julie and for our peers, some of whom are here today, uh, uh, not only where we pursued our academic interests, but also where we honed and deepened our uh, connections with Israel. And we had plenty of space and opportunity to do that, uh, even then. Uh, but I am jealous of today's students, because that space has only grown. Uh, it's impossible, impossible, to overstate the significance of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies, uh, both on this campus and as a flagship for this emerging field in the United States and around the world. 
So I, I want to add my salute to uh, Lynn Schusterman and Stacy Schusterman and the Charles and Lynn uh, Schusterman uh, Family Foundation and to Lisa Eisen uh, for their vision and generosity and commitment uh, to former President Yehuda Reinhartz uh, for his leadership in getting it launched. Uh, I want to thank President Ron Leibowitz uh, for your commitment to taking Brandeis's engagement to Israel, which I've seen you do personally, uh, into the next level, uh, and of course also for our friendship. Uh, and to uh, Rabbi uh, Ellenson and Elon Troen and Rachel Fish, uh, now Jonathan Sarna and others uh, on the faculty of the center, please know how much impact uh, your work is having uh, beyond this campus as well as on this campus. And I have to say a word of appreciation uh, and gratitude for the opportunity to share the podium with my dear friend, uh, President Rifka Karmi of Ben Gurion University. Uh, part of my, as part of my role as U.S. Ambassador, really it was my favorite part, uh, was making it my business to get around Israel and engage with Israelis uh, in a range of, from a range of backgrounds and every institution. Uh, the, really, the place is the least likely to expect a U.S. Ambassador to walk through their doors. It's really something I think very much in keeping with the spirit uh, of the study uh, of the Israel studies as practiced here uh, at Brandeis. And those visits brought me on a number of occasions to Beersheba. Uh, it's less than an hour's train ride by, uh, from Tel Aviv now, uh, where I uh, every time encountered this dynamic leader, uh, Dr. Carmi, uh, who together with the university's uh, inspiring faculty and, and students uh, have really put Ben Gurion University on the global map, not just on the Israeli map or the Jewish world map. You only need to spend one day there uh, and uh, see the breakthroughs that the university is pioneer pioneering in cybersecurity and in water technologies and in the inclusion of Israel's Bedouin population and in many, many other fields uh, to know you're really in one of Israel's academic jewels and agents of change. So Rivka, I'm honored also to be with you today. So I completed my service uh, as U.S. Ambassador uh, to Israel uh, about a year and almost a year and a half ago, I guess a year and two months ago, uh, after five and a half years at that post. And needless to say, uh, not an honor I ever anticipated uh, taking on when I was a student at Brandeis, but really the greatest honor that we've had in our lives to represent our great country to a great ally that we feel such close bonds to. And so now in, in this post-government period where we've decided to spend a little extra time in Israel, uh, I'm reflecting on and trying to process some of what uh, I learned and, and experienced in that, uh, in that time. Now, we spent a lot of time with Israelis, uh, and I must say uh, I'm fascinated, and I'm sure this will speak to people here who know Israel well, by uh, a paradox at the center of Israel's national character. Uh, on the one hand, and especially nowadays, there's a kind of muscular self-confidence, uh, and rightly so, good reasons. Uh, Israel faces no immediate threats, existential threats, uh, of the kind it faced in 1967 or 1973. I was in Israel for the Yom Kippur War in 1973 as a boy with my family, and the fear of uh, neighboring Arab armies overrunning it uh, that was real then is gone today. Uh, Israel has a world-class military uh, motivated by excellent people and uh, top leaders and cutting-edge technology. Uh, it has a strong alliance with the United States, which I'll say more about. Uh, which is widely supported by the American people and both parties in this country. Israel's expanding its relationships in Asia and Africa and Central Euro and Eastern Europe and Latin America. I mean, just look at the world tour Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, has been on, including his recent visit to India. It's it has a developed high-tech economy uh, that's producing great innovations. It's opening doors to Israelis around the world uh, and providing a good life at home. Uh, and these days, Israel faces relatively uh, less diplomatic and economic pressure on the Palestinian issue than it traditionally has, which has often been a source uh, of a lot of tension. So that's the source, I think, or what lies behind that self-confidence. And on the other hand, Israelis continue to uh, foster a deep uh, and persistent sense of, of vulnerability. Uh, some of it's residual, uh, left over from earlier traumas. Uh, some relates to current threats and the reality of families still sending their children off to military service. There are potential existential threats, particularly Iran, uh, if some time down the road it acquires a nuclear weapon. There have been, of course, the waves of uh, terrorist bombings and, uh, and, and, and rockets and stabbings and, and tunnel attacks uh, that have touched many families. Somehow, and it's outrageous, and of course part of uh, our mission here is to deal with that, uh, the question of I Israel's legitimacy continues to hang in the air and be debated in ostensibly uh, honorable international forums. Uh, advocates for BDS, they make a lot of noise. Uh, and I don't think they actually have had much impact, really a negligible economic impact, uh, on Israel. 
Uh, but uh, their calls echo an earlier era of boycotts that are hard to forget. Uh, there are some known educational and, uh, and economic gaps uh, within the uh, uh, Israeli population, including among growing segments of the Israeli population, uh, that could, over time, if not properly dealt with, threaten Israel's uh, economic miracle and, and some, indeed, its social cohesion. And despite the lack of pressure that I mentioned on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, the ex existential questions at the heart of that issue about Israel's Jewish and democratic character, they just don't go away. And they continue to be debated and, and be the, at the center of, public, uh, of the public discourse. So that's a pretty potent cocktail of strengths and challenges and, uh, and also uh, the capabilities and everything surrounds them. So it's perfectly understandable that Israelis uh, vacillate between that kind of self-confidence and that kind of vulnerability almost on a daily basis. Now, thankfully, and I really was honored to have a, a lot to do with this, Israel's alliance uh, with the United States, which is, of course, key to being able to manage uh, those pressures, is strong, uh, and it's only gotten stronger. And I'm very proud of the fact that even though there were some prominent disagreements between uh, the Obama administration that I served and uh, the Israeli government at the time, uh, the bilateral relationship was strengthened in some very, very tangible ways during, uh, during the same period. It grew stronger in the area of security cooperation, culminating in a $38 billion uh, memorandum of understanding that's enabling Israel to buy 50 F-35 Joint Strike Fighters and maintain its military edge for the next decade. It grew stronger in the area of joint military training, where virtually every month, senior American uh, delegations uh, from all branches of our military train with their Israeli counterparts. It grew stronger in technology. Uh, where we pioneered breakthroughs in missile defense, particularly uh, following President Obama's visit to Sterot in 2008 as a presidential candidate and experiencing the, the threats that Israelis were living with. Uh, and that's produced funding for Iron Dome and for David Sling and for Air 3, really life-saving funding uh, as uh, Iron Dome has uh, intercepted over 1,000 rockets uh, aimed at Israeli populations. We have new technologies to defend Israel against the tunnels that are being dug under the Gaza border. The relationship grew stronger in intelligence cooperation. It was always strong, but it's more intimate and more integrated uh, and more coordinated than ever before, sharing real-time information, uh, deploying our assets in a strategic way to avoid duplication and expanding into new geographic and technological realms, especially cybersecurity. It's been strong, got stronger in diplomatic coordination, uh, where uh, despite a very prominent disagreement in December of 2016 on a UN Security Council resolution, shouldn't take away from the daily work done by American diplomats and Israeli diplomats to uh, defend Israel from the campaign of delegitimization uh, all over the world and to block anti-Israel measures during the Gaza conflicts and after the Turkish flotilla and at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Extension Conference and on and on and on and the outspoken support for, United, by the United States against uh, the BDS uh, movement uh, and the encouragement we've provided for other nations to expand their relations with Israel. And the relationship got stronger in the uh, uh, business and uh, commercial uh, field as well. Uh, Israel's already become the, the home of so many R&D centers for American technology companies, uh, but now the traffic is two-way with more and more Israeli companies, including here in the Boston area, uh, basing themselves in the United States, creating jobs here, using the United States as their platform to go global as well. And we took measures to lower barriers and encourage the enga uh, engagement of entrepreneurs and investors uh, as well. So all of that happened during that same period that we had some known uh, disagreements. And the good news, of course, is that U.S. and Israeli interests remain uh, very closely aligned. There's obviously no other country in the Middle East uh, and few in the world with whom we are more closely aligned uh, and uh, in our view of the challenges and opportunities we face in a very troubled and dangerous region. The more challenging news is that while our interests are closely aligned, they don't overlap completely. That's not actually news, of course. In every period and with every pairing of every president and prime minister, even as cooperation and common approaches have increased, some disagreements or at least different perspectives uh, have endured. There's a lot we're doing together and will do together that hasn't changed and won't change, but the region is changing. And so many of the assumptions that bound together our common efforts in the past are changing. So one question that I'm asking myself at the moment is, how are we going to continue to cooperate while managing our differences to enable us to limit risk, to address the threats, and advance the opportunities we both face? How do we manage what are very similar but not identical interests uh, in a changing Middle East? My observation is that most, on most of the big strategic questions, U.S. and Israeli interests remain very closely aligned. 
confronting the threats of terrorism and weapons of mass destruction, countering Iran's uh, malign interests in the region, building on the alignment between Israel uh, and the Sunni Arab states as a community of U.S. allies, honing our capabilities to protect ourselves from cyber attacks, continuing to expand that burgeoning economic and technology partnership. But there are some other issues, some of them perhaps strategic, others may perhaps, perhaps the tactical questions within strategic issues on which our interests may diverge. The extent of U.S. military presence in the region, for example, and the role that U.S. forces play. How to manage the regional roles of other powers like Russia and China. How to prioritize questions of democracy, human rights, and stability in the Arab world. And questions, of course, about Israel's own self-definition over time. So I don't have a one-size-fits-all prescription about how to manage uh, the areas where we might have some disagreements, and I doubt one exists. Uh, but I think the first step is trying to understand where their interests converge and where, less often, of course, uh, they diverge. And to realize and accept without any qualms or uh, any difficulty that we're extremely close and supportive allies, but ultimately two different countries uh, whose interests are not always identical. To me, there's nothing to be afraid of about that fact. It's actually more a question of management uh, and uh, doing it with our eyes open. As in almost any relationship, it's better to confront those types of questions honestly rather than uh, with denial. So instead of being uh, scared of some occasional uh, daylight uh, between us or pretending it's not there, the relationship actually is stronger when we recognize it and deal with it honestly. So let's look at a few recent and current examples uh, of, of such issues. In some cases, I'm defining the interests as I understand them to be uh, over, uh, uh, enduring over time, even if the current administration may uh, define them a little differently. I'll try to note that uh, where it's appropriate. Uh, the first category of these disagreements, I would say, derive from uh, issues on which we have a common threat perception, uh, but the disagreement is primarily about what tools to use, uh, it, how in which cases uh, the U.S. and Israeli interests in containing and managing and removing that threat are the same, but there may be differences in how we choose to do so. So let's take Iran as the most obvious of those issues. It's undeniable that today we're dealing with a more aggressive, more assertive Iran that seeks to expand its influence in the Arab world. Some will describe that as a result of the Iran nuclear deal and the sanctions relief that enabled a partial economic recovery. Others will point out that it was the U.S. invasion of Iraq and a rather badly mismanaged aftermath and that transition that eliminated the strongest counterbalance to Iran's regional ambitions. But however one describes the causes, the trends are very clear. So Israel and the United States share an interest uh, in confronting Iran and working to curtail its threatening uh, uh, activities. And on many specific tactical aspects, we have agreed and continue to agree. But we may differ on the use of certain tools and the timing of when we should use them and the costs we should pay. So the nuclear deal is a good example of that. We disagreed about it, but in almost a vexing way because the disagreement derived from an area of almost complete strategic agreement. We always were in agreement and alignment on the strategic imperative of preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. And for years, we engaged in the closest, highest level consultations between the most senior levels of our government uh, to share our intelligence on the Iranian nuclear program, to build and design and enforce the sanctions regime that brought the Iranian economy to its knees. President Obama put in place a military option that we did not have when uh, uh, he took office that would enable the United States, if all else failed, to destroy Iran's nuclear facilities. And we briefed Israel fully on that. Now, we also knew, of course, that at some stage, if the negotiations got serious with Iran, we might draw the line differently between a good deal and a bad deal. And that was something we talked about very openly. Uh, those are very legitimate differences between uh, two allies uh, who have different perspectives uh, and uh, closely aligned but not identical interests. Israel, given its size and its proximity to that threat and its military capabilities, understandably had a lower risk tolerance than the United States given our size and our distance from the threat and our capabilities and our global uh, responsibilities. So we disagreed about the deal and uh, how we both chose to manage that disagreement uh, or not manage it as well as we should have had a lot to do with the tensions that followed. Two quick stories on that. In January of 2015, I was sitting at my desk at the U.S. Embassy and I received a call from the State Department. They'd just been informed by the office of the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, uh, that he was about to announce that Prime Minister Netanyahu would be coming to Congress to speak against the Iran deal. And so I was asked, did I know anything about the Prime Minister's plan to come to Washington? 
I did not, which was a little embarrassing. It's the kind of thing an ambassador's supposed to do. So I told him to hold on, and I'd get some information. I picked up the phone, uh, and I called uh, the Prime Minister's National Security Advisor, Yossi Cohen. Today he is the director of the Mossad, a dear friend, uh, someone with whom I have a deep relationship of trust. And I caught him in Moscow. He had just landed there for talks with his Russian counterparts. And I said, uh, Yossi, I've been asked, I've just been told the Prime Minister's coming to Washington uh, to address Congress. Uh, is there anything you'd like to tell me? <laughs> there was silence on the other end of the phone. Give me five minutes, he said. <laughs> so it was apparent that he himself did not know. Uh, he called me back five minutes later, good, good on his word, confirming that the report was true. Uh, and it, but it was clear that that plan had been arranged in the narrowest of channels, even within the Israeli government. Uh, it wasn't only not shared with us, but even with other members of the Prime Minister's team, because it was so unusual to have the Prime Minister come to the Washington under those circumstances. But I have to say this, a little over a year earlier, the shoe was on the other foot. Uh, Yossi Cohen's predecessor, uh, National Security Advisor General Yaakov Amidror, someone else I had a terrific relationship with, started in the fall of 2013 to drop hints to me about a set of bilateral U.S.-Iranian uh, talks that had not been shared with Israel, while the public focus was on the P5 plus 1 talk, the big international talks taking place with a lot of fanfare in various capitals. And it turned out that Israel had detected through its own means uh, that these talks, the famous Oman channel conducted by my colleagues Bill Burns and Jake Sullivan, uh, were underway. These had not been shared widely within the U.S. government, uh, including not with me. I was cautioning General Amidor not to draw uh, the wrong conclusions, but later I had to eat my words. Uh, and I told him that had I known of those talks, I would have pressed very hard for us to brief the Israelis on them in real time in keeping with our usual transparency. Now, both of those episodes underscored for me one of what I see as the iron rules of managing our occasional divergences of interest. Be transparent with one another. Openly discuss our disagreements. Share bad news directly. Uh, rather than let it arrive by surprise by another source. We'd adhered so well to those principles for the first five years or so of our bilateral work on the Iran issue, it was when we got away from those principles that our disagreements became much harder to manage. Now, I hope the Trump administration and the Israeli government uh, will be similarly transparent with one another. That's not an easy task when you have a president whose calling card is unpredictability. Uh, but at least on Iran, he's been a consistent critic of the nuclear deal, the JCPOA as it's called. And his new appointments, uh, Mike Pompeo to be Secretary of State and John Bolton to be National Security Advisor, uh, certainly strengthen the chances that he's going to follow through on his instincts and withdraw from the deal. It won't surprise you to know that I remain a supporter of the deal. Uh, it's not perfect, but it did what it most needed to do. It removed from Iran's possession enriched uranium and centrifuges and a plutonium reactor and put in place an intrusive monitoring program uh, and in so doing, it systematically blocked off every pathway Iran could take to reach a nuclear weapon. And it leaves us with great confidence that Iran will remain at least one year from that capability for at least a decade, which is far better than where they were before the deal, which is about two to three months uh, from an, a nuclear capability and able to do it at a time of their choosing. The deal, I understand well, does not end the Iran nucle Iranian nuclear program. That was probably an unachievable objective. But it buys us considerable time, and it allows us to prepare for, prepare for ways to extend that time further. And there are many Israeli security experts, including many former chiefs of staff of the IDF and Mossad directors, the current chief of staff of the IDF, who have pointed out that the fact that the deal is in place enables Israel and the United States to confront the other nasty things Iran does around the region, sponsoring terrorist organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, deal with Iran's involvement in the civil wars in Syria and Yemen, uh, it, deal with its development of ballistic missiles, and to deal with those without those activities taking place under an Iranian nuclear umbrella. Now, I think the deal can be strengthened. The JCPOA can be strengthened. There are talks underway with European governments uh, aimed at achieving that with even firmer inspection protocols and lengthened deadlines or elimination of sunsets and new restrictions on the missile uh, program, and I hope those can succeed. But President Trump's also threatening a unilateral termination uh, of the nuclear deal on a fairly arbitrary deadline of May 12th of this year, even as his own officials testify that Iran is complying with its obligations under the deal. And that threat is alienating our European partners who remain committed to the deal, and in my judgment, it's undermining our ability to achieve the goals of strengthening the agreement. In fact, if the President follows through on that uh, threat, I think the only beneficiary is going to be Iran. 
Iran's already received the bulk uh, of the benefits of sanctions relief, and if the United States withdraws, it, could, it will be immediately released from its own obligations under the nuclear deal. Now, this sounds like the President uh, is operating on the Prime Minister's slogan of fix it or nix it, uh, which is a strange slogan because those are two 180-degree opposite strategies. One of them, nixing it, canceling the deal, would bring us much closer to Iran, much, uh, much closer to a conflict with Iran much sooner. Without the deal and the constraints it puts in place on Iran's nuclear program, we may find ourselves in very short order with no option other than a military option to prevent an Iranian nuclear weapon. And I think that's actually the point where uh, our interests may diverge again. The United States, even in a Trump administration, deeply hostile to the nuclear deal and to Iran, is going to want to decide for itself, not cede to any other country, including Israel, to decide when and how to find ourselves in the situation uh, where we'll use force, and is going to want to control uh, that decision making. And that only makes sense, uh, given the costs the United States could incur in blood and treasure and our international standing, and how it could affect other priorities, like our effort to contain and roll back the North Korean nuclear program. The other strategy, fix it, the one I hope we'll pursue, which is trying to augment or supplement or extend the deal, may actually result in a stronger deal. But we have to be honest, it's not going to end Iran's nuclear program. It will buy more time. Now, that would be a real accomplishment, but it does fall short of what uh, the Israeli government has identified as its hopes uh, that can be achieved. So even with a president and a prime minister who have a similar outlook, it's going to require some skillful diplomacy and open communication between our two countries to manage those differences and not to lose focus on those things that we clearly agree on, which is increasing pressure on Iran in the non-nuclear areas and strengthening the nuclear constraints. So let me look at a couple other types of issues where the U.S. and Israeli interests sometimes diverge. The second category I'd identify are cases where Israel prioritizes the strategic gains it can secure by events in its neighbors in the short term, while the United States, taking a broader regional and global perspective, uh, cannot ignore strategic risks that may only present themselves in the long term. And Egypt, after the fall of Mubarak in 2011, the offers the clearest case of this short-term, long-term divide. Israel and the United States differed to quite a significant degree on our approaches to the Egyptian governments that followed uh, the Mubarak government. The United States viewed the Muslim Brotherhood government, it was led by Mohamed Morsi at the time, following the election of 2012, as a freely and fairly elected government. I think everybody who monitored that election thought so. Uh, that represented the democratically expressed views of a significant percentage of the Egyptian population and which had pledged itself, uh, whether one believed it or not, had pledged itself to nonviolent and democratic rule. Some Israelis said to me, why do you favor a Muslim Brotherhood government? And I responded, we didn't favor that government, but Egypt has regional influence, a longstanding security par partnership with us, which we hope to sustain, uh, a peace treaty with Israel that we hope to sustain, and the risks of long-term instability in Egypt would be very grave, and we have to view this as a government that we need to engage and test and hold to its commitments. But my Israeli friends viewed our belief that a government led by a Muslim Brotherhood leader with a deeply held Islamist outlook that it could ever rule democratically as a hopelessly naive perspective. And uh, even though they felt that way, they worked hard to maintain their own connections to the Egyptian intelligence and security officials. And that actually made a big difference in the Gaza War of 2012, uh, together with the Obama administration's diplomacy with the Morsi government in containing that uh, conflict only eight days and imposing a ceasefire on Hamas on favorable terms for Israel. But I have to say this, the Israelis were not wrong about Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood government. It was only days after that Gaza conflict ended, and it was perhaps emboldened by the leadership role that Morsi played in securing the ceasefire, that Morsi turned the Brotherhood's commitments to dem democratic governance on their head and began to govern in a, in a truly autocratic fashion. Fast forward about six or eight months, and General Sisi, now President Sisi, led uh, the Egyptian military in deposing Morsi. Morsi. And Israeli friends came to me uh, really ecstatic about it. And they had a hard time understanding why the United States would debate internally and struggle with the question of whether Sisi had conducted a coup d'etat uh, to overthrow the, uh, the elected government, which would have necessitated a cutoff of our military assistance uh, to Egypt under US law. I'm not sure they fully appreciated uh, the degree to which the Obama administration twisted ourselves in a pretzel uh, in order not to make that declaration. 
uh, despite nearly overwhelming evidence uh, that it was a coup d'etat, including a very bloody day with over 1,000 civilians killed by security forces. Israelis then and today spoke and speak of Sisi as almost a kind of miracle. Uh, the first leader of a Muslim country since the Iranian Revolution of 1979 who had successfully rolled back the political rise of Islamists. And their support for him is total. They view him as a committed counterterrorism partner. He's worked to defeat the threat of ISIS in Sinai. He's been deeply committed to maintaining the peace treaty with Israel. He's increased pressure on Hamas uh, together with Israel. Uh, he's worked hard uh, uh, to uh, lead a counteroffensive of moderates against extremists uh, region-wide. And I have to say this, they're right. They're right about CC on every point. And President Trump has clearly in endorsed that view. And even though President Obama was cooler towards CC than Trump has been, he didn't do anything to shake the foundations of the US relationship with Egypt either. But, and here's the point of divergence, there's a potential stability trade-off in the short term versus the long term, which the United States, given our history and regional responsibilities, cannot ignore. CC's rule, for all of its benefits, in terms of regional dynamics and the weakening of extremist elements, calls to mind some of the other features of Mubarak's regime. And those include a closed political system and the crushing of even peacefully expressed dissent and the elimination of any nonviolent outlet to challenge the government. Those were characteristics of the Mubarak government. We actually warned them about it as late as November of 2010 on the eve of what turned out to be a wholly fraudulent election that nearly eliminated any opposition voices in the Egyptian parliament, and I think it was one of the last straws that led to the uprising that resulted in Mubarak's fall two months later. So while Israel is not wrong at all to see Sisi as a close partner and worthy of support, the United States is not wrong to worry that his style of governance could be sowing the seeds of the next Egyptian revolution with all the violence and instability that that could bring. And even the Trump administration, which is uh, less outspoken on democracy and human rights than its predecessors, is not blind to the tensions between those views. And the election this week, actually this week, tomorrow, starts the voting uh, in which President Sisi's re-election is absolutely assured, is going to raise questions of those differing Israeli uh, and American uh, perspectives again. A third category of cases where U.S. and Israeli interests sometimes diverge involves differences about the costs each of us should pay to achieve common objectives, and particularly the use of U.S. forces. So Syria uh, is the most common venue where that type of question uh, is presented. Just this week, we were reminded of exactly this question from over a decade ago. Uh, it was published in Israel for the first time. Uh, it was known for many years, but for the first time, it was cleared for publication in Israel that Israel operated in 2007 to destroy the Syrian nuclear reactor in Deir el-Azur. Uh, a great accomplishment for Israel, uh, but sometimes forgotten in that story, it only was conducted as an Israeli operation after Prime Minister Olmert failed to convince President Bush that the United States should be the one to carry out that strike. So more recently, we've had other kinds of convergences and differences about events resulting from the Syrian civil war. We've agreed from early on that the Assad regime has uh, forfeited any legitimacy to rule in the country because of its brutality and genocidal crushing of the opposition. Uh, we've agreed that the rise of ISIS was a deeply dangerous and destabilizing development that was critical to be, uh, we destroy it uh, as, the, as a nascent state before it became any more established. Israel was not a formal member of that coalition, but it provided significant uh, intelligence that assisted us in the defeat of ISIS and helped Jordan and Egypt address their own uh, ISIS challenges. And even the U.S. decision in 2013 not to strike the Syrian regime targets after its confirmed use of chemical weapons, this is the famed red line incident uh, that sometimes Israelis raise about President Obama, uh, was not seen at the time among Israeli leaders as a mistake. They understood that they actually got a better strategic result because of the U.S.-Russian agreement. Uh, that led to the verified removal of over 1,300 tons of Syrian chemical weapons. That agreement largely eliminated the strategic threat of chemical weapons being used against Israel. At that time, actually, I was negotiating with the Israeli government about when they were going to distribute gas masks to diplomats and their families. You recall, Israelis used to carry their own gas masks, per personal gas masks with them. Uh, we ended up buying our own, by the way. <laughs> uh, but to show you uh, how Israel felt about the agreement that we reached, as soon as it was signed, Israel suspended its program to distribute 
gas masks to its own citizens, and that program has never been restarted. It was only later that Israel began to express concern that the decision not to strike Syria at that time sent a message about the United States' broader determination not to involve itself directly militarily in the Syrian civil war or to engage more broadly in military campaigns in the Middle East. And that may represent the point of divergence. But it wasn't just President Obama. It's important to state that. When he turned to Congress that fall of September of 2013 to seek authorization for the strike he had prepared against Syria, and the administration lobbied hard for it, it became very clear that there was virtually no support in Congress. And Congress probably well represented the American people. And I'm not sure that's to our credit, that despite the moral crisis of a genocide in Syria and the use of chemical weapons against civilians, American people have had their fill of intensive military engagements in the Middle East after the costly decade of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And President Trump is not so different. He pursued the counter-ISIS campaign that President Obama started with vigor, but he generally sends very similar signals about any broader American involvement in the fighting in Syria. So when former Secretary of State Tillerson described the mission of the 2,000 American Special Forces being kept in, Israel, in, in Syria, he made clear that their mission uh, is to prevent the reemergence of ISIS and not to fight the Israel regime and not to fight its Iranian and Hezbollah allies. And President Trump has reiterated that caution on several occasions. The United States and Israel do share an interest in preventing Iran from establishing an even firmer foothold in Syria as ISIS is defeated and vacates territory and the Assad regime is, is stabilized. And that situation clearly poses risks to Israel. Iran has made very clear that it, it tends to establish military facilities and move in Shia militia and perhaps even air and naval bases and develop a clear path to arm its Hezbollah proxies in Lebanon through Syria and to use Syrian territory to launch attacks against Israel. But as I noted, the United States probably wants to do less than Israel might like us to do on the ground to address that Iranian threat in Syria. So Israel has responded by taking matters into its own hands and very much with U.S. support. This is a good way to manage such a divergence. Israel's ability to conduct operations in Syria to defend itself from those attacks and prevent the shipment of sophisticated weapons into Lebanon was a very frequent subject of conversation between President Obama and Netanyahu, and it's an area where they uh, enjoyed strong agreement. And the former head of the Israeli Air Force, General Amir Eshel, announced uh, when he retired about six months ago that nearly 100 times Israel had struck, uh, had conducted raids to strike such weapon shipments over the last five years. That's something Israel only does with uh, strong coordination uh, with the United States. So ensuring that continued Israeli freedom of action and legitimacy to act and, and potentially act against a much wider set of targets is going to be critical in the period of ahead. That's what happened on February 10th of this year when Israel retaliated very strongly in Syria because of the incursion of an Iranian drone from Syria into Israeli airspace. And so that's where U.S. and Israeli interests can continue to coalesce, and there's more the United States can do to help Israeli uh, freedom of action uh, well short of a U.S. kinetic military role. Now, other than Iran, all the examples uh, of the U.S.-Israeli divergence that I cited took place in parts of the Arab world where uh, that remain very unsettled for extended periods of time after the upheavals of 2011. The parts of the Arab world that have remained more stable uh, in that period have produced less divergence between Israel and the United States, so it's been much easier to manage our respective approaches and keep them aligned. Talking about Jordan and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, here the Israel and the United States have found uh, uh, that our respective interests are both served by supporting these rulers uh, who exhibit political moderation and reformist tendencies uh, and uh, somewhat upgraded military capabilities uh, and an ability and inclination to keep uh, a lid on extremism in their societies. And those countries, all those Gulf states and moderate Sunni states, have emerged really as strategic partners to Israel, not with formal relations, but nevertheless, because they share so many of the same enemies, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, uh, et cetera. And those common interests create an undeniable opening for warmer ties between uh, those Sunni states and Israel. And both the United States and Israel have encouraged those Arab states to make public gestures, economic exchanges, visits, academic ties, overflights, diplomatic meetings, what have you, that would demonstrate the beginnings of a normalization process. Both our country's interests would be served by the warming of ties between America's partners in the region. And there was a significant step forward just this week when, for the first time, a commercial airliner, it was an Air India flight from New Delhi, 
was permitted to traverse Saudi airspace on its way to Tel Aviv. That's good news. Uh, and the warm ties ex uh, on display this week between the Trump administration and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, may create openings for additional progress. But at times, I think there is a kind of irrational exuberance that has set in uh, over this, uh, in the thinking of some Israelis, as if the steps uh, for full normalization with these Arab states, these strategic partners, are just around the corner, are going to be provided cost-free. It is an open secret that there's security cooperation and security convergence between them, uh, but those Arab governments remain very timid about openly acknowledging their ties with Israel. And it's because of the unresolved Palestinian issue. It remains a block on their doing so. They fear the blowback of their own populations who are generally, genuinely sympathetic to the Palestinian narrative and also have been educated, miseducated for decades with anti-Israel propaganda. And they fear uh, giving Iran a propaganda victory uh, as in the regional rivalry as if Iran can say the Arab states are uh, no longer championing the Palestinian cause. So that discussion brings me, of course, to the pursuit of an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is where I'll close. And it, it's really, in some ways, the quintessential example of an issue that both uh, unites and divides Israel uh, and the United States. Although today, I, I must admit, I'm more concerned about the convergence than the divergence, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, like a number of his predecessors, President Obama came to office determining to do all he could, not only to ensure Israel's security, but also to help achieve a two-state solution. Uh, with the Palestinians. Those efforts were supported uh, by Prime Minister Netanyahu despite disagreements. He always said he wanted negotiations without preconditions. He said in his Bar Ilan University speech of 2009 that he understood the result would be two states. In his words, a demilitarized Palestinian state that recognizes the Jewish state. He made clear he wanted to avoid Israel becoming a binational state. And that comported exactly with President Obama's understanding that it's a fundamental interest of the United States that Israel continue to be a strong, secure, Jewish and democratic state far into the future. Now, I won't detail all the reasons the negotiations failed. They're well known. Mistrust between the leaders, mistrust between the societies, waves of Palestinian terrorism, and incitement and glorification of violence, including paying salaries to terrorists in prison. Arab states, as I mentioned, being far too timid about opening up their ties with Israel and using that to advance negotiations. Uh, of course, expansion of Israeli settlements in the West Bank, which make it harder to achieve a separation uh, into two states were part of that, and that last factor became a source of significant disagreement uh, with, uh, be with the Obama administration. Now, I have many, many differences with President Trump. I won't detail them all here, uh, but uh, I've generally not criticized his approach on this issue uh, as it was led by Special Envoy Jason Greenblatt for most of 2017 because I felt it was well within the mainstream of traditional U.S. policy on the issue. It calls for two states, regardless of the president's avoidance of that specific term. When he talks about the ultimate deal, there's no other outcome that can achieve what he defines as the ultimate deal of a peace agreement between the two sides, recent negotiations that meets Israel's security needs and Palestinian uh, self-determination needs and opens up Israel's relations with the Arab world. I've served in the Middle East for almost 30 years. That's a two-state solution. Uh, and his method uh, was quite similar uh, of engaging the Palestinian leadership even while uh, calling on them to curtail incitement. And uh, actually putting some pressure, quieter and more muted than the Obama administration, but nevertheless a pressure on Israel to uh, limit the expansion of Israeli settlements. And of course rejecting Hamas's participation in Palestinian governance uh, and putting a priority on improved Palestinian economic conditions, including significant U.S. assistance. All of those are very traditional uh, approaches. I even felt that the President's decision in December to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital was actually correct on its merits. Jerusalem has always been and always will be Israel's capital. Uh, we treat it functionally as such. I drove every day from the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv to do the business of state in the Israeli government affairs uh, offices. Uh, presidents and secretaries of state have based themselves there. Uh, that's no mystery. But crucially, he missed an opportunity, a very important one, to place that decision within the context of the broader efforts to achieve a two-state solution. That was a mistake. And it made the decision, which could have been used to help advance the strategic objective of a two-state solution, difficult for the Palestinians to absorb. I actually still hope they'll correct that mistake when the U.S. Embassy uh, in Jerusalem opens uh, in May of this year. And of course, the tension has escalated. President Abbas has made some very ugly and outrageous remarks about Israel and about the U.S. ambassador to Israel. And I think it signals the end of his personal participation 
in efforts to negotiate a two-state solution. And the administration, frankly, has not shown much interest in providing a ladder for him to climb down from the tree he's in. But I have to say, in fairness to them, the truth is there's no reason to expect that there was any possibility of a serious breakthrough in the current circumstances, regardless of the approach they took. The Israeli and Palestinian leaderships are both consumed by domestic crises, a rivalry with Hamas and a succession struggle on the Palestinian side, and multiple corruption investigations involving the prime minister on the Israeli side, and it makes both of them highly unlikely to have the flexibility to take bold and creative steps. But President Trump, we're told, still uh, intends to present a plan for the Middle East, for Middle East peace. If it's a credible plan, if it clearly holds out the ultimate goal of a two-state solution, but doesn't put the parties in a position where they need to immediately try to negotiate that outcome, it could actually give the United States additional leverage to get Israelis and Palestinians and Arab states to take some of the steps they could take by themselves outside of negotiations uh, that would help uh, preserve a two-state solution. That should be the goal of the steps on the ground right now, not to establish a two-state solution in the near future. That's not possible. Rather, to preserve the two-state solution as viable and an achievable uh, goal for the future when better leadership circumstances prevail. And even though that seems very distant now, uh, it remains critical to helping ensure Israel remains that strong, secure Jewish and democratic state and, and close U.S. ally it has been uh, far into the future. So what worries me today, I just said a few moments ago, is the potential emerging convergence for the first time in decades between Israeli leaders and American leaders who do not see a two-state solution as a common interest. I listened very carefully to the significant majority of current Israeli cabinet ministers. Quite a number of them are good friends of mine. Uh, and they're openly and sincerely opposed to there ever being two states. I disagree with them, but I do take them seriously and take them at their word. And I tell them what I think. I have yet to hear anyone convincingly explain how Israel uh, or the United States or our bilateral relationship will be better off from any of those alternative paths. Now, meanwhile, Secretary of State-designate Pompeo and our incoming National Security Advisor, John Bolton, have bo both signaled deep skepticism, if not outright hostility, to the prospects for a two-state solution. And if President Trump's political views are as unstable on this issue as they seem to be on others, uh, it's easy to imagine him being influenced away from his more traditional approach of his first year in office. And so as Israel faces those dilemmas and as the United States could face its own set of challenging decisions uh, if it becomes apparent that the two-state solution uh, is dead, uh, I think we should uh, acknowledge that there actually are alternatives to a two-state solution. In my judgment, they're all worse but they deserve greater study uh, in places like Centers for Israel Studies uh, because we could end up in one of them. In all of them, Israel will still exist. In all of them, the United States will still have commitments to uphold, uh, and the United States uh, will want to protect uh, and maintain the close partnership it has. But let's be clear, none of those alternatives will end the conflict. All of them will put us closer to the binational reality that Prime Minister Netanyahu consistently says he wants to avoid. All of them will raise questions in the minds of many in the international community, uh, many Americans, and not a small number of Israelis, about Israel's Jewish and democratic character. And that's going to have implications for our bilateral relationship, changes that are very hard to predict with precision, but I think which would be foolish to ignore. And I say all of this as someone who for my whole life, including back in my days at Brandeis, uh, has defined Israel uh, as a key part of my Jewish life and a key part, partner to the United States. I, I'm in the camp of former Vice President Biden, who says, if we, the United States, did not have an Israel, we'd have to invent one. Uh, and I continue to believe that the United States has both moral and strategic commitments to uphold regarding Israel, and that we also enjoy clear benefits to U.S. interests from our partnerships. And in some ways, what proves the durability of the partnership is not that we never disagree, but that when we do disagree, when we do define our interests in less than identical terms, we're able to overcome it. It's always best when we coordinate and work together in the same direction, and sometimes we just have to acknowledge that there are some areas where interests are not fully aligned. So is Israel and is all of us prepared to cel uh, celebrate a great achievement, its 70th birthday anniversary this year? I actually remain optimistic about the strength and durability of the U.S.-Israel alliance in this changing Middle East, as long as we have leaders who are committed to the fundamentals of the partnership and, and then know how to manage through the differences, whenever possible avoiding acrimony and partisanship and finding a common path. So I hope that our current and our future leaders in both countries will be wise enough to continue that approach. Thank you very much.
we're going to take a few questions. So if you'd like to ask Ambassador Shapiro a question, just raise your hand and we have individuals who are holding the microphone who can come around. So we have one right here in the front middle and I'm just going to hand my microphone to Ruth Bevan. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It was very enlightening. What, in your estimation, is the motivation of the Crown Prince of Arabia, of Saudi Arabia? Uh, what will be its impact, the reforms on the Middle East? And a side question from a back street, what do you think the Me Too movement will mean in the Middle East? <laughs> well, I suspect uh, the Middle East has plenty of Me Too problems. I'll just uh, pick that up at the, at the beginning. Um, uh, maybe a bit more hidden from some of our own, although uh, we obviously uh, can see how much work we have to do. It's one of those areas where um, uh, I, I think uh, I, we as Americans uh, should be a little bit modest about uh, how we uh, project uh, onto other cultures because we can see even within our own society uh, how deep a problem that is, but I'm sure it's very deep there as well. Uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, is a... Uh, uh, a, a truly uh, transformational figure, or potentially uh, so. Only 32 years old, I believe. Uh, clearly the first of his generation uh, that will, uh, if all goes as planned, rise to leadership in the country. Uh, his number one focus uh, in terms of international uh, issues is not so different from uh, his father and his uncles uh, who served as king, and that's Iran, who uh, Saudi Arabia sees as the uh, primary threat. I. I I have been hearing Saudis and Israelis talk to me uh, in almost identical talking points about Iran for well over a decade now. Uh, they see Iran uh, the same way, and that has created this uh, potential uh, convergence of interests. And he, because he's young and because he seems to be uh, willing to uh, tackle taboos uh, that other Saudi leaders have been very cautious about and seems to have the support and confidence of a lot of younger Saudis, uh, he may be willing to do things that other Saudi leaders have not witness this overflight of an Air India uh, commercial airliner. It's one small step, but no, a step nobody else uh, in that uh, royal family was willing to take. He's, of course, very, very focused on internal economic and social reforms as well. That probably drives his agenda much more than anything to do with Israel. Um, but potentially there's room for him as a taboo breaker to look for ways to involve Israeli technology and the modernization uh, and diversification uh, of the Saudi economy. Uh, on the other hand, he, so there's a lot to be excited about and hopeful for and to be supportive of there. On the other hand, he's a bit headstrong, uh, he's a bit impulsive, he may not know what he doesn't know, uh, and he's already found himself embroiled in a number of uh, foreign misadventures. Uh, a war in Yemen that seems to be going nowhere and, and producing grave civilian casualties, a, cu a boycott of Qatar, uh, which has divided the Gulf uh, states and uh, uh, leaves uh, uh, the United States torn between allies where we have military bases on both sides, uh, forced resignation of the Lebanese prime minister, perhaps intended to put pressure on Hezbollah, but which seemed to rebound and do the opposite. Um, and if one believes certain reports, uh, an attempt to convince the Palestinian leader, President Abbas, to accept a, a very, very meager uh, proposal uh, if it's presented to him by uh, President Trump that would not be a proposal any, ser any Palestinian leader would seriously be able to accept and survive uh, to end, uh, end the conflict. So uh, with a lot of uh, hope and a lot of possibility, there's also a lot of, uh, I think, uh, a, learn a, lot of a, le a large learning curve uh, for him to traverse. Hopefully he will do it uh, with... Uh, uh, openness to the views of allies like the United States and uh, avoid these sort of headstrong, uh, impulsive uh, actions that uh, seem to lead into dead ends. Other All right. Bill, I feel like I'm on a talk show. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of an American ambassador to Israel also being Jewish? thought about that. Um, you know, I was the third uh, American ambassador uh, to be Jewish, Martin and Dick, who did it twice during the Clinton administration, and Dan Kurtzer preceded me. Uh, I think both of them, particularly Martin, uh, endured a, a much more challenging uh, uh, path because on both sides it was trailblazing. So it was known for many years the State Department raised questions about would it be appropriate to have somebody Jewish uh, in, uh, in Israel as our ambassador. 
would there be questions of dual loyalty? So he had to kind of overcome that at home. And then when he got there, a lot of Israelis sort of cocked their head to the side and said, what are you? Are you one of them? Are you one of us? We're not quite sure what to make of you. Uh, he did the job very, very, very professionally, of course. But it meant that by the time I got there, a lot of those questions were resolved and really settled, and people were not surprised to see that, I, of course, uh, they, they knew I was Jewish, but that there was no question about what my role there was, fully uh, uh, operating as a, a representative of, a, of our government. Um, at the time, the British ambassador, uh, Matthew Gould, was the first British ambassador uh, uh, when I got there. And I think he was going through Martin's experience 20 years later, both more in the UK even than in, than in Israel. Um, but for me, I found that it opened doors and it created uh, opportunities for connection. Uh, people uh, could see that our family was uh, felt a, a certain affinity for Israel that is maybe unique to Jewish families. Uh, they saw we were celebrating the same holidays. Of course, we were speaking the same language literally and figuratively. Kids were spending time in Israeli schools. To me, it opened doors, uh, but in no way uh, that I felt uh, were, did it put at, uh, uh, in question uh, what my role there was uh, for almost every Israeli I met. So I think it, it can be an advantage. It was for me, and we've had very successful, I hope uh, I'm one of them, uh, Jewish ambassadors. We've also had very successful non-Jewish ambassadors, and I'm sure we will again in the future. I certainly don't think it should be a requirement that our US ambassador uh, be, to Israel be Jewish. I will say this, while I was there, uh, we also had a Korean American ambassador in Seoul and a Chinese American ambassador in Beijing and an Indian American ambassador in New Delhi. We've long had Irish American ambassadors in Dublin and Italian American in Rome. I actually think it says something quite lovely about us as a country uh, that we are maturing in our multiculturalism to a point where those questions about uh, dual loyalties are really not uh, 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 obstacles anymore. Rather, we embrace the connections it can uh, produce between Americans who have some uh, family uh, or historical connection to a place and that place uh, as an advantage uh, to both sides rather than a threat. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I want to take you back to the last two months of the Obama administration. Um, the decision about the settlements, at least for the mainstream in Israel, especially after Trump took power, seemed to be sort of the last step of the United States government to be against Israel. I don't know if you can disclose your personal opinion regarding it, but I wonder what was going on in, Tel in the Tel Aviv embassy and sort of what was the mood as part of the United States Foreign Service people. Right, so thank the you. The question, thank you, it's a good question. I get it almost every time, uh, which is what was going on that led to the abstention by the United States at the UN Security Council resolution in December of 2016 that dealt with the issue of settlements. So first you asked my own views on it. I've said publicly it's not new. Uh, that sh I couldn't live without that. Uh, not only because it happened the week of my daughter's bat mitzvah, it really wasn't what I needed then. Uh, but I had recommended we try to find a different approach that I didn't see uh, an abstention on that resolution as providing us with much benefit. I did recommend we either veto it or try to steer it and shape it into some other sort of product, which is very hard to do. Frequently, a resolution is presented to the Security Council and you vote it up or down. You don't really get a chance to negotiate the text. But I do have to back up just a little bit uh, to explain uh, the decision. So I was not for that decision, but I want to make sure I, I can explain the context in which it occurred. For most of 2016, when the peace talks had already kind of run their course and there were no uh, prospects for a new round, there was a lot of discussion in and out of the Obama administration about what should the last step be. Should it be a speech? Should it be a Security Council resolution? Should it be a presentation of par parameters for a two-state solution? Uh, President Obama had never made a decision on that. He didn't tip his hand one way or the other. Uh, and it was very clear to me uh, the day after the election uh, with the somewhat surprising outcome, I think it was more surprising in Trump Tower than anywhere else, uh, that uh, the president was not going to seek to do anything on that issue. He had much bigger fish to fry in his last two months during that transition with President-elect Trump. The Cuba deal, the Iran deal, health care, the things he had really accomplished during his uh, tenure, rather than try to open up a new point of disagreement with Trump or with Congress or with the Jewish community or with Israel, not something he was looking to do on his way out the door. Now, at the same time, almost immediately after the election result, and this is what I experienced in Tel Aviv, uh, there was almost a celebration among Israelis on the right, particularly settlers and their advocates in the government, who said, wow, the election of President Trump, we think, from uh, the things he said or his staff said during the campaign means the end of the United States pursuit of the two-state solution. It means the end of the United States opposition to settlements. We can build anywhere we want. We can annex where we want. We can legalize the settlements the Israeli Supreme Court 
has declared illegal, and they were advancing legislation in the Knesset to do just that. And I did go into the Prime Minister's office on several occasions during that period, and I said to them, you know, I don't know if that will be the Trump policy or not. Turns out it's not, by the way. But I said, if, if you think it is, my recommendation is you wait till January to act on it, because we have one president at a time. President Obama is still president. And he might be faced with some decisions. And, you know, I think they knew that, actually. I think they understood the danger. I think it's even on the record that Prime Minister Netanyahu made the same argument in his cabinet, uh, but nevertheless felt pulled along by the political pressures. Uh, anyway, when the resolution finally came up, uh, it was uh, sort of cleverly drafted by the Palestinians to sound very similar to U.S. policy on settlements. It was a little more balanced than the one the president had vetoed in 2011. It wasn't balanced enough from my perspective. I'm not sure it was for his perspective either, but he had to make a judgment call. And the judgment call he made was, with all of this talk, if the discourse in Israel is about the death of the two-state solution on our watch, uh, is there anything we can do to try to help put down some... Uh, anchors and some barriers that would keep the two-state solution from going over the cliff and keep it alive so that our successors, hopefully, uh, will still be able to work on it. Uh, so that was the logic. It was a judgment call. I probably would have made a different judgment. I would have made a different judgment, but uh, that's what it was. A lot of things were said about the resolution and the process of deciding that it weren't true, that it was a last act of vindictive score settling with between Obama and Netanyahu. It was nothing like that. Uh, it was said that the resolution ripped Israel's uh, ripped the coattail out of Israel's hands. I don't know if anyone's been to Jerusalem recently. The coattail is still very much in Israel's hands. Um, it really established the same principle that many, many previous resolutions through many resolutions and many administrations have said, which was that changes to the borders from 67 will only be recognized by the international community through negotiations. That's what it says. Uh, of course, that will involve changes to the borders. It's not going to be the old borders, but that uh, you need to go through negotiation process. So, in my judgment, the resolution, while I didn't support it, uh, was largely inconsequential uh, and probably less dramatic than some of the discourse around it. Any questions? There's one over here. And then, Karen, if you can note over here. I'm just wondering, um, what should we expect, or do you have any expectations of what Iran will do when the uh, key provisions of the agreement expire? Well, you mean when they expire in the normal course of time or if the administration withdraws from the agreement? In the normal course of time. Yeah, so the, this is the, the sunset clause issue, uh, which many Israelis and other opponents of the agreement uh, argue is one of the weaknesses of the agreement, that it uh, prevents Iran from doing uh, uranium enrichment and uh, development of advanced centrifuges for X number of years, and then about year 10 or 12 or 15, some of those uh, restrictions uh, start to come off. Um, my view is Iran, this regime anyway, still intends to try to achieve a nuclear weapon. I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, they want to dominate the, reg the, the region. They have hegemonic ambitions. They have ideological fixations against Sunnis, against Israel, against the United States. I don't think there's any question they want that technology. So it was always my expectation that this resolution, this agreement was one where we would have to come back and negotiate an extension. It doesn't mean you have to negotiate extension in year one or two of the agreement, but before year 10 of the agreement, you will have to negotiate an extension. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, they have made various commitments long-term about not pursuing nuclear weapons. We don't have to trust them on that. We, they have made long-term commitments to inspections that would help us ensure that they uh, don't uh, violate those, or if we, they do, we will know it. Uh, they, uh, but, you know, there's also the possibility, of course, that in this 10-year period, we might be dealing with a different Iranian regime. We don't know that. We can't count on that. That wasn't the bet that was made, but it's certainly something we should also be open to. There were demonstrations earlier this year in Iran. Still, they're ongoing. They're quiet, but they're still ongoing against the regime, in part because of them squandering the, mis the sanctions relief uh, benefit, uh, not to help their own people, but rather to arm Hezbollah and, and send Shia militia uh, to, to Syria and to Yemen. Uh, so that regime may not be uh, exactly the same regime. Certainly it will be a new ruler. He won't live 10 years uh, by the time uh, they, they, ex they expire. Uh, but it was a, a way that bought time. It didn't do more than that. It bought time. But time is valuable. Uh, this is something I hear always repeated to me by senior Israeli security people, not people of any... Uh, who maybe even shared some of the Prime Minister's uh, criticisms of the deal at the time, uh, but they said, time is valuable. We can confront Iran's other non-nuclear behaviors in ways that we could not do if we were doing it under a nuclear umbrella or at much greater risk. 
uh, and we can develop new intelligence and new technologies and new military options, both U.S. and Israeli, so that uh, if we are unable to negotiate that extension in year 8, 10, 12, uh, we have other options as well to ensure that there's no Iranian nuclear weapon. So we'll take the last question right here. Yep. Hi. Considering the recent breakdown of sorts between world Jewry and Israel, um, your name has been floated by some commentators to possibly replace Nathan Sharansky at the head of the Jewish agency. Have you considered that at all? Um, and more generally, how does American Jewry's relationship with Israel affect the U.S.-Israel alliance? Uh, so, uh, the latter uh, is one, one journalist who wrote a, a, a flattering column along those lines. I, I don't think there's ever been a non-Israeli head of the Jewish agency, uh, at least since there's been a state of Israel. So uh, it, seems like it un seems like an unlikely uh, scenario, I'll just say that. Um, uh, but I do think the uh, relationship between American Jewry and uh, Israel is a central pillar uh, of the U.S.-Israel bilateral relationship. And it's one of the reasons that this sense of some distancing and some tension and some uh, alienation uh, or also lack of engagement uh, on our side uh, is, is worrying. You know, I sp I've asked this question by Israeli, uh, in front of Israeli audiences a lot of the time, and I always say to them, look, I will take on myself as an American leader, as a Jewish leader, and our community, we have the first order responsibility here. If there are uh, uh, trends in the American Jewish community, especially among younger American Jews, uh, to be less engaged, to be less educated, to be less knowledgeable, uh, to be more apathetic, or even feel uh, some, uh, some negative uh, feelings toward Israel, we have to take that on ourselves. We have to create opportunities. The Schusterman uh, Family Foundation is uh, one of the great leaders uh, in this uh, with uh, the support for Birthright and uh, many, many other programs like that. The Jewish Agency, of course, does it with the Massa programs. There are many, many opportunities, but we as Jewish leaders and we as an American Jewish community need to make sure uh, that we are doing everything we can to provide the education and the opportunities and the engagement and the uh, personal experiences that keep our own community connected uh, and caring about what happens in Israel. But there are things Israel can do that make that easier or make that harder. Uh, and they should also bear in mind the uh, impact of their decisions. So when you have an Israeli government that uh, speaks the language of uh, annexation, or members of an Israeli government, of annexation uh, and the end of a two-state solution and uh, widespread settlement expansion, they ought to bear in mind uh, what that uh, impact has, if they care, which I think they do or they should, uh, what impact that has on uh, attitudes in the American Jewish community. If they are uh, uh, not showing the commitment to religious pluralism, particularly by canceling the Kotel Agreement, uh, that really touches on the most uh, personal identi Jewish identity issues uh, for American Jews, they should be aware, uh, if they care, and I hope they do and they should, uh, that uh, that's going to have some, uh, make, make it harder for us to do our job uh, here to keep these communities connected. I'd add to it uh, this month the uh, crisis over the asylum seekers from Africa. Uh, there's legitimate issues to, to debate about who's an economic migrant and who's a, uh, a, an asylum seeker deserving of refugee status, but they haven't done a serious process uh, to determine who is who. And if there were to be a wholesale expulsion of those people, they should be aware uh, that among the uh, effects of that will be a, a, a very painful reaction uh, among American Jews, who they, I think, will want to have as their, their supporters. Um, you know, it, I think, is a little harder in the Trump-Netanyahu era, uh, of course, because uh, there's a, an alignment uh, of one side of the political spectrum, uh, and uh, that's hard for a lot of uh, uh, progressive American Jews to, to, to absorb. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a pendulum in American politics. Uh, sophisticated Israelis understand that. Uh, and most Israelis I speak to, even right of center Israelis, they might be happy with Trump for this or that, uh, they might like Netanyahu for this or that, but they do understand that uh, there's some real risk uh, if not managed well, and again, first responsibility is here, but they have a role to play uh, of uh, further drift and further distancing between these two communities, and therefore it will have a, over time, not in maybe the next year or two years, but certainly in the next decade or two, uh, it will have a, an impact on the uh, bilateral relationship between our countries. So it has strategic import, not just uh, Jewish uh, peoplehood import. Thank you very much, Ambassador Shapiro. Thank you.
there's a professor of international peace building at University of Notre Dame. His name is John Paul Lederach. And he actually wrote a haiku um, that was called Advice from the Mediator's Fellowship. And he says in this haiku, don't ask the mountain to move, just take a pebble each time you visit. <laughs> and I think that's what you do, and we thank you for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. We will now have a 10 minute break. We will begin promptly at 4.50 with Professor Elon Choen and President Carmi. Thank you.